Okay, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Let me shut this off. That way we won't have any interaction. Thank you for joining us. It's one o'clock. I see a lot of comments. You just played my favorite music. Thank you, Asi. I didn't know that. So that's something we share in common. Um, I love her music. The two that I played are actually my favorite two, one of them from South Africa, and then this one now from the lady from Nigeria. Okay, we are continuing. My name is Vic, Victor. I am an ordained reverend. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, I'm licensed um, substance abuse therapist. Um, so any and everything counseling, I'm helping people to change. That's what we do. My wife and I, I mean, we are uh, founders and co-founders of Together Forever in the Institute for Marriage and Family Therapy. We've done quite a lot of work in this area. Uh, started volunteering in 1994, we have stayed with it. We have done um, quite some things at all this tongues that we're hearing. Let me try and, and stop them. People joining, I think it's coming from my phone. Let me shut that off. Um, that way we won't be disturbed. Okay, now continuing, um, as I said, we've written quite some books, I think to date about 12 or 15 of them, all bordering on marriage, family preparation, um, helping people pick up the pieces, preparing young people to get into marriage. We've collaborated with quite a lot of people. To date, we have, uh, by the grace of God, trained about 4,000 marriage mentors from 20 countries around the world. Uh, so today we are going to talk about how to get ready as a and I hate that noise that is clicking. I don't know where it's coming from, but we have to bear with it and continue to go. Um, uh, as I said, we have done quite some work in this. Today we are going to be focusing. We have one hour. I'm going to go real fast to focus on uh, new practitioners uh, startup. How do I start up? How do I, where do I go from here? I have the certification. I even have an office. I have a desk. I have a phone. I have a business card. I'm giving them out. Where do I go from here? Um, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on in, in, our, in our talk today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few tools that you need to continue uh, to practice, to be successful. Now, let me tell us, uh, this profession is a difficult one. Not because we made it difficult, but because it's hard to help people change. It's hard, difficult for people to change. And historically, this has been approached from different angles. Some have said, if you need to change people, you need to change their emotion, their emotional response to things. And that's how they approach counseling or behavioral change. Some have said you need to change their thinking. Some have said you need to change their behavior. Uh, some have approached it from different angles. Some have said you need to change the system that they operate in. Incidentally, that's the one I subscribe to, that if you change the environment, if you change the system that people operate in, you're likely to change the result and how they behave. Um, if, uh, and that's, I, I can't go too much into that, but we're gonna give you some tools. There are some learning objectives that we want to accomplish. As I said earlier on, I really want to acknowledge my wife who is not here. Uh, without her, I cannot do much. What am I sharing? That's not what I want to share. I want to share my screen. 
not Facebook. Um, hopefully we can get there. Okay, there you go, there you go. I hope you're seeing my screen. So I've said that this is a new practitioner's workshop. What are we going, who are we hoping to be here? Aspiring coaches, those who are already coaching, those who are new into it, um, mentors, here give us, uh, help us leaders. Why? Because all these people are in one business, helping people to achieve their desired goal, helping people to change, helping people to move forward in whatever they want to do. Whether, whether they want to play soccer, they want to feel good, they want to achieve more, that's what all these people do. Oh, feel good, feel good, recover, healing. That's what all these people do. So the skills are the same. The skills that we use to change people. Uh, we are going to focus on marriage and family. That's the perspective we're gonna come deal with this. What are the learning objectives? Four of them. I've limited them to four uh, because we have just an hour or maybe a little bit over that. The first one is marriage check up. If you've done our programs, you have learned about intake and information gathering and the essence and the importance of that. Uh, the, well, the marriage checkup is going to talk about a little bit about what do you do with those information that you gather. Uh, we do say that if you ask the right question, you get the right answer. And I bet you also, I will also add that if you ask the right way, you get all that you need to get. So, so we're going to talk about marriage checkup. That's a tool that we use. The second thing, startup tools. What do you need to be successful as a practitioner in whatever field? In this field in particular, I have a lot of tools that I use or we use in our counseling. Uh, and I do have my go-to tools for every kind of problem. For, your, for the youth, I know exactly what to tell them. Uh, if it's not working, I know the tools to pull out. Um, if communication is a problem, I also have my fallback tool. Um, whatever the issue is, your tools make your job easy. And knowing how to use those tools even make it a lot easier. Think about it. If you have to use your hand to cut a tree, and if you have to use an ax or saw to cut a tree, think about the difference. So that's the same thing in what we do. We will talk about some tools that you do need. We will talk about how to identify your niche. I will introduce you to some areas of practice that you might begin to think about. Is this where I'm called? Uh, but I dare to say that at this beginning, if you're getting into this new, you basically have to try as many things as possible. You never know until you know. So, and, and that's for us, that's how we got here. I introduced myself as a marriage and family therapist and then substance abuse. When we set out to do this, it wasn't about substance abuse. It was, in fact, it wasn't even about marriage and family for me. It was about prison ministry. How do I help prisoners? And then when I got to prison, I, I looked around, I said, wait a minute, these people have wives, these people have children, what is going on with them? And until we address their wife and children, I'm not gonna get these people stable. That's how personally I joined my wife into marriage and family. So. Uh, so it's one thing that led to the other. And then the substance abuse thing, I actually went to do a grad school, a master's degree in marriage and family. And then I said, wait a minute, let me go see what's going on with the prisoners who are married. Uh, when they get out of prison, what happens to them? So I went to the homeless place to do internship. And voila, I said, okay. So the problem with these people is actually drug. It's drug that take them to prison, 
back and forth, back and forth. So we really need to address drug so that we can help them stay out of prison. And once we started talking about drug, we realized my wife and I, oh, they have mental health issues too. And if someone has anger or depression or anxiety, we can't talk about marriage. We gotta have the skills to help them with the anger, with the depression, then we can talk about marriage and they will listen to us. So that's how we get to all these things. So why am I saying this? You gotta try different things to know what's your, where your niche is. And I will talk about some niches. And finally, we'll talk about self-care. And I have a very big quote on that, a very big saying, if you don't take care of yourself, what happens? Hopefully that wouldn't happen. So how do we do money checkup? I'm sorry. Um, now, when you've gathered information, marriage checkup is basically assessment. How do we assess what's wrong with this couple? We got 200 informations that we've gathered from them, their name, their previous marriage, how many times have they had divorce, family of origin, um, uh, how many times do they fight? We have all that on paper. How does that translate into the problems that they are having? Now, if you've done our course, you've seen us talk about the overview of problem areas in marriage, sources of problems in marriage. We've also talked about solutions to those overviews. But sometimes these things are way out of things that you don't know. You see a doctor there, when you go to see a doctor, sometimes just telling them how you feel doesn't give them confidence in getting to the bottom of your problem. That's why they do a checkup. They send you to do tests. They say, go do lab, go do this, because I'm really, I, I have an idea, but I want to be sure. Or sometimes I don't know what's going on with you. Perhaps the lab will tell me more so I can make an informed decision. So that's what marriage checkup is. What do I use? I'm going to introduce us to one of the things that I use or we use in our session. Uh, some of us would say, is this available? No, if you, this course is free, but I will talk about how you can get it. Um, the marriage diagnostic and assessment questionnaire. This is 25, 26 pages questionnaire. I'm not gonna go through them, but what this does for you it helps you to get all the information that you need. When you go to a doctor, they might run, okay, let me use example as, as, as a addiction therapist. If I just want to get a casual uh, result, I might do a saliva test. I might do a urine test. Uh, so I might order those things. Um, I'm just trying to get uh, some information about what kind of drugs you are taking, what kind of drugs I'm dealing with. But if I really want to get to the bottom of it, I'm going to order a blood test. I'm going to do a whole lot of other tests that I, we will use to get to the bottom of your drug problems so that we can address it. Because someone might come, they'll tell you they're smoking marijuana, but they don't want to tell you they're smoking, they're, they're uh, shooting heroin. They don't want to tell you last week that they did X. They don't want to tell you all the things that they are doing. So blood test captures all the things that are in their system. So that is what this 25 page document does. It kind of gives you overview of what is going on. You see here, this one talks about the structure and background of the family. This is family of origin question. It talks about husband, it talks about wife, it talks about, he asks about the children in your family of origin. And it talks about when they died, who is dead, who is alive, because all those things affect you. Then it comes to courtship. You see, courtship history, where did you meet? Uh, what was unique? What is the unique quality that you notice about your spouse when you saw them the first time? Why? That first impression is a fun impression for most people. Now, I know that some people, uh, when they met, they were not thinking about marriage. But the first attraction, the first time, 
that's one of the go-to tools that we use. If I see couples who are fighting and arguing and quarreling and they're not talking to each other, if I can get them to think about the first day they met, but first the incident surrounding their meeting, uh, suddenly you see them loosen up. They then realize that there's a bigger fish for this. There's a bigger picture than what we are fighting over. So uh, that's what this is trying to get to. Uh, what was the unique quality? We might notice their six pack. We might notice their uh, petiteness. We might notice their beauty, their voice. You know, it's just something. If you're married and you're sitting there and you think back, you will find out that there was something that separated this person, that made you notice this person. So we want to start from there. What attracted you to the spouse? Describe your dream spouse at 16 years of age. What am I getting to? If you've taken our course, this question gets back to the uh, unfulfilled expectation. What was your expectation about your marriage? What was your dream? Is that and then I'm go, it will go on and ask you questions that would elucidate the answer as to whether those dreams are being met. Are you living those dreams? Is that fulfilled expectation or unfulfilled expectation? If it's fulfilled, okay, good. If it's not, how are you handling? the unfulfillment, the disappointment. Are you adjusting to your realities? Are you struggling? So these things are all the questions that we elicited. And when I look at this form after we have completed it, I'm saying, okay, she wanted to marry an engineer. She ended up marrying a pastor. Is that where the problem is coming? from maybe, maybe not, but that's for me to explore when I sit in session with you. And then we have what we call scaling. Scaling is on a scale of one to 10. Tell me, do you feel fulfilled in your marriage? You're trying to get a vibe. You're trying to get a gauge on how they feel. Now, if they are in session before you, and nine out of 10 times, the woman will say two or three, <laughs> nine out of ten times the man will say eight or nine we're doing well no problem the woman will say many problems um bonnie raises his hands is that you're not hearing me um i have people watching but if i have to answer you then i gotta get off the screen um hopefully that's not what you meant let me I'll get off the screen and come back just to find, be sure that we are okay. Uh, good evening, Safiq. May kindly share the presentation with us at presentation from South Africa. Uh, Bonnie, I can't see your question. I can't see a lot of what the issue is. So uh, I can't even see your hands at about being raised. But anyway, let me get back to the screen and then we continue from that. Where is the screen? Okay, here's the screen. Okay, so this is Kellen. And I'm not, as I said, this is 25 pages. I'm not gonna dwell a whole lot on it. Uh, the next one that it talks about is the marital preparation. This really zeroes in on how did you get ready for marriage? Was it four hours counseling? Was it two hours marriage education? Did you do thorough preparation before you got in? Because uh, uh, if you were not prepared before you got in, or if you got poor preparation, poor marriage education, poor mar premarital counseling, you came from a background that has this functional marriage, you're going to fail from beginning. And I'm just failing, I'm meaning you're gonna start limping. You're not gonna start on a strong footing because you have no tools, it's not your fault. The university that you went, the certificate, the issue is that of dysfunctional marriage, I'm sorry. The counseling you got four hours for a lifetime of activities, that's not enough. 
That's not enough. The teacher that taught you have no clue. Faulty problem, big, big problem. So they, can, they only give you what they have. So I want to explore that. I want to see where you prepared. That's part of the diagnosis. That's part of the checkup that I do, um, that we do. Um, a family of origin structure. I talked about that a little bit. Um, uh, personal information. I'm wanting to now get your personal information. Do you, are you aggressive? Do you use alcohol? Are you compulsive? Are you this? Are you that? Level of satisfaction. This is where you have to really be a little bit careful because people are not really going to uh, say bad things about you. For instance, level of satisfaction about your sexual relationship with your spouse on a scale of zero to 10. If you ask husband, they're going to get different results. As long as he's getting it, he's gonna say nine or 10. Uh, but if it's not done well, if the bedroom is not sizzling, the woman is gonna say zero or one. Same people, same bed, same activities. You're getting different results. So that's why this is so cool because it's x-rays. It goes beyond yes and no. It forces people to give you the answers that you're looking for. And look at here, at the end of it, you have a scoring. If they score between this and this, that tells you this, the relationship is doing very well. If they score between 144 and 101, your relationship has some major problems and on and on. It kind of grades them based on the answers you're getting. And then it starts talking about spiritual relationship. Uh, it talks about family issues. It talks about decision making. Now, this is a big one. This is where people get unsatisfied about marriage. If their word does not count, in other words, their votes don't count. So one person is dominating the decision making process. One person's interest is being met. One person's vision is being pursued. The other person is just a cheerleader sitting by the side and cheering the other one. I tell you, that's where they are. That cheering and that cheerleading is going to faint out because there's no interest. There's no passion. So, but if we join together in decision making, doing the vision statement, having a vision statement, and for those who haven't done our course, vision statement will sound new. For those who have done the course, especially in the last two years, you heard about vision statements. It's a tool that is a, um, that, is a, that unites couples. And a lot of people who have done it have liked it. So that's one of the tools I'm gonna uh, kind of get, get off of it. Uh, that's one of the tools that we use, marriage, uh, ch uh, check up now. Somebody else is saying some good evening from Nigeria. This is Felicia. Hi, Felicia. Hi for you joining. And I, I, I thought you had a question, and someone had a question. Uh, tell us some tips or guides to start a marriage counseling school. Uh, wow. If you want to start a marriage counseling school, it means you can afford it. You gotta pay me. That's consulting. That's not start up, I'm <laughs> counselors, not consultants. Uh, so, but anyway, and I must serious thing, note, if that's what you wanna do, we have one. We will share, gladly share that with you, but that's not the focus of this particular course. Now, we go to the next thing. The next thing will be start up. Uh, I like what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, give me six hours to chop a three and I will spend the four, the first four hours sharpening the ax. In other words, I'm going to spend a lot of time preparing my tools, preparing my tools because that makes my job easy. So when we talk about tools, tools are as important as skill. If you have the tool, you got to know how to use it. If you don't have the tool, you know how to use it, failure. If you know how to use it, you don't have, it's like knowing how to drive, you don't have a car. What are you going to do? Borrow, maybe borrow, but 
uh, you are limited in terms of how much you can get out of that driving skills that you have. But you have, you have a car like I did when I came here. I bought a car before I learned how to drive. <laughs> I bought a car and actually used the vehicle that I bought to learn how to drive because nobody has time to teach me how to drive. So one morning I just got into the vehicle, drove around the apartment complex, drove twice, drove three times. The next day I had to go to work or they would fire me. There was no one, the guy who was taking me to court to work, to work wasn't available. Guess what? I got into the vehicle very early. I got in like 5 a.m. Was supposed to start at eight. So I got in when there was no traffic. So, and I drove from the apartment complex, and that's in US here, to work. And throughout that day, that work, I was thinking, how do I get back home? <laughs> I made it to work, all right? No traffic, no police, nothing, no accidents, thank God. How do I drive back to my apartment complex with all the traffic, <laughs> with all the police in their place? But I, I did it. So. But Abraham says you need to spend time on your tools, honing your tools. Uh, spend more time than you spend on the other things. And the Bible, this is also supported by the Bible. The Bible in Ecclesiastic 10.10 10 says, If the axe is dull and the blade unsharpened, more strength will be exerted, but skill produces success. It kept, nothing puts it more better than that. Nothing puts the essence of tools, the essence of having the right tool and knowing how to use it gives you success. Otherwise, you will be struggling. You will be struggling. And in what we do, we have prepared, because we did all this. We did, we practiced with nothing. Because the idea wasn't to be professional or do this full time. We had other things that we were doing, but we were not getting results. And we figured, okay, if we didn't get results, not because there was no tools, but because the tools that were available wasn't really made for our population. The information we had wasn't serving our African and Caribbean population in the US who were our market. We couldn't see information on how to deal with in-laws. We couldn't see information on how to deal with extended family because the books and materials that were there were written by the Europeans and they didn't have these problems. So we went out and started developing our own tools. So one of them is what you have seen here. Uh, you have the marriage complete uh, kit for successful marriage counseling. If you've taken a course in the last, this year, you have the, uh, we have the first two, the Advanced Marriage Mentors Manual. You have the Marriage Mentors Manual. You have that by virtue of the fact that you took the course this year because that was incorporated into your tuition. If you're gonna be taking this course, you will also get those two books. You will get them in piecemeal uh, while you're taking the course and afterwards the whole book will be made available to you. Now, if you are in, other than US, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, no, US, Nigeria and South Africa, uh, we're going to have to find a way and be creative how to get it to you because these books are available in the U.S., they're available in Nigeria, they're available in Johannesburg. Uh, the rest of it, we have to arrange on how to get it to you. Uh, but those are the manuals. There are, we also have now the companion books. If you look at the blue one, the blue is for boys. Um, yellow, purple is for girls. What does these two books do for you? It gives you homework. You see those questions that I was asking on the marriage checkup? Those questions are here for each session. This book arranges the sessions for you. In other words, if you're saying, where do I start? Do I start from communication? Do I start from intimacy? Do I talk about boundaries? Do I go to talk about conflict resolution? 
and you don't know where to start. You don't really need to think about it because this book takes it from intake to through uh, personality, through what is marriage, and it leads you all the way to 10 sessions. Now, the typical or standard sessions for a typical marriage counseling, couples counseling is 12. That's generally. Now, most experienced therapists don't do 12. They do three years, four years, because there are issues that come up. But the typical one is 12 sessions. Now, 12 sessions does not mean 12 meetings. Some of the sessions you can stay for six months because you're dealing with communication. If they haven't gotten over communication, you can't go into intimacy because they can't communicate there. So, so an intimacy and sex is really about communication. It's really about body and soul and mind communication. So if you cannot get beyond the, the nitty gritties of that engine, because that's what we say that communication is the engine that drives relationship. If you cannot start that engine, you're not gonna do very well in the bedroom. So that, that is it. So this book arranges it for you. What is more about these materials? They kind of ask the questions gender-based. I wish I can pull it up for you here and show you some of the questions. But the question we ask the wife or the female is not the same that we ask the male because the, their approach, their views of marriage is different. And if you're a Christian, the responsibilities are also different. So that when we design the questions on, 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 uh, on um, submission and love, whereas we would ask, the man about love, we'll ask the woman about submission. When we talk about uh, views and perception of marriage, they will be different because we're expecting different questions. Both of you are from different marital backgrounds. So your views and your idea about marriage is not gonna be the same. So as a therapist or coach, you're soliciting their personal view because that's what is affecting their marriage. It's not the book view. It's not the Bible view. What's dealing with them and they're having conflict with is how they see marriage. The interpretations they have made of what they have read in the Bible, what they saw on television, what their mama and papa told them, that's what is playing out in their marriage. And that's what you're trying to get to. If they just repeat to you what the Bible says and you cancel them based on that, you haven't solved any problem because that's not their problem. So that's one tool, uh, let me share. So this is, if you have taken our course and some might ask how much is this, the he's and has is just two, 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 two thousand naira. I think it's hundred rand in the US, in um, South Africa. And in the US, uh, I'm not sure how much it is, but you can find out. I gave you my WhatsApp number. That's me. Now, if you're not calling for the book, don't call me. This is for sales. So that, that's what it is. Now, what other tool do I use that, that's available? Now, some of us are saying, what is this? Is she showing us some canality, some obscene things? No, 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 no. I'm just trying to portray the tango dance. That's a communication tool that is built on this, on the tango. It's actually called the tango communication. And what it just says is you take your turn to talk. You focus on the substance as opposed to emotion and you take turns to talk. So, and if you see those people dancing, for them to get this choreograph this way, they have to focus. They have to respect each other's move. They have to adapt and accommodate each other's move. If they are not doing that, they are going to fall. Look at that lady in both cases. The guy on the left, the, on, uh, the, the guy and the man, in each case, one person is supporting the other. Otherwise, both of them, at least one will fall. So I, we have, a communication tool that we use that is built on this. And this is one of our go-to for couples who cannot communicate. Now, um, I say our go-to, I 
use it when I have to, because as I said earlier on, I am a system person. I'm not a behaviorist, teach you how to do what to do. I believe you change the system, things change. Uh, now, am I completely right? No, but that's just, I'm a melancholic. That's just, I'm a deep thinker. That's just what I'm lended to. That's what works. My wife probably would lean towards this because it's telling you what to do. It's more of actions and behavior than it is about uh, thinking and putting your mind a lot into it. Uh, so that's what we use now. I want to tell us that if you are a counselor and you, this is not in your curriculum, if you've taken our course, there are 12 things that you have to do to be successful, or at least 12 things that are your job, your job description. Now, you don't have to do all of them at the same time, but you do different ones at different times. The first one is screening, which is you look at people, listen to them and say, am I, is it what, are you asking me to do what I do? Uh, they tell you, I'm kind of dying, my stomach is swollen. Uh, at that point of screening, you know they need a doctor, they don't need you. <laughs> so that's what screening does. So you get to intake, that's when you get a lot of information. You get to orientation, that's when you tell them about you, how you practice, when you practice, how you, whether it's by phone, online, or what time you work, your hours of service, how you're paid, that's the orientation. The first one we did about marriage makeup is hovered on assessment. Assessment, that's where you really assess other things. And then you have other things that I'm not gonna go into. You gotta have a treatment plan. Let me see if I can pull uh, this out and show you a little bit about treatment plan. Um, but anyway, I'll offer that later on. You gotta have a treatment plan. In other words, after you have done the assessment with the marriage check up that I gave us, actually some call it, call it marriage diagnosis. You got to come back and say, now, where is the problem? You say, okay, they are having problem in the bedroom. Their views of marriage is divergent. Uh, they have problem in money management. You, have, you list all the areas that they have issues. And then you now sit down and say, which one do I address first? The bedroom? intimacy, the money matters, heavy hitter, or do I address communication? That's treatment plan. And you say the immediate plan is what you start with. Which one is bothering them the most now, here and now? That's what we start and address first. And then we go to the other ones later. Now, a lot of us will say intimacy will be the thing bothering them a whole lot. No. Our money will be the thing bothering them the most. No. What's bothering them the most is communication. If they can communicate, they can address those two issues. So we want to address their communication issues. Now, if their views of marriage and their personality is one that they don't understand, we gotta do that before even communication. They have to understand why they communicate the way they communicate before they can make change and accommodate each other's uh, things, each other's behavior. So you gotta go to personality and to do that. So that's what treatment plan does. And then there's a few lot of things that happen in session. As I said, my, uh, counseling is about changing people, how you treat them while you're in session, knowing when to yell and when to keep quiet, when to listen, all those things count. That's what happens in session. How you conduct yourself would help you for them to buy what you're selling or not. So but this is, the this is not the focus of today. I just wanted to show us. Then you have the case management. How do you manage your cases? Do you stress them out? Do you deal with what's not happening before you? What is not happening before you is that your client's work is stressful. Because it's stressful, they go to work, they are stressed, they come home, they take it out on their spouse. That's the problem. If we're gonna address the work stress, then we can begin to handle the things that are happening in marriage. Otherwise, you're just beating about the bush. 
That happens with stress and uh, with case management. The things that are not immediately directly concerned, uh, related to the issue before you. It could be that your client has a case in court. It's about to go to prison and be stressed. So how do we manage that? They're about to be evicted from the apartment. That's what the conflict is coming from. We gotta address that, perhaps become an advocate if you have to be. Talk to the landlord and say, can I buy, you buy these people some time, give them some more three months so they can gather money and pay you and not harass them every day. See, if they fall apart, you're not gonna get your money anyway. So now why don't you help me manage these people so they can get you your money. You gotta deal with crisis management. They fought last night. You've been doing so well, but something happened, they fought, or maybe they didn't fight. Now, one of their sons got into trouble, and that's causing a lot of problems. Client education, referral, bookkeeping, as I said, and that's not why we are here today. So I'm not so much going to go into it, but it's good for you to know that these are all your job descriptions, and they come up at different levels of your practice. Um, so... And then the final learning objective for us today was finding your niche. How do you find your niche? <laughs> I have said this before. If you listen to our course, one of the things that I share is that what I heard from the, the uh, pastor, T.D. Jakes. And what he said was that you have to be in demand before you can make a demand. In other words, you cannot have a niche for yourself until you have become a niche. <laughs> you have to have master one. And how do you do that? You got to shop around a little bit. You got to learn. You got to expose yourself. I've just shared how we started as lawyers. Then we became, for me in particular, passionate about those in prison and then passionate about those who are married and having issues. And then those who are drug addicts, you have to get, and quite recently, you see me talking a whole lot about grief and loss. Uh, I guess because I lost my mom in 2015, that really may have been a turnaround for me. So some of these things are personal. Uh, so I am passionate about grief and loss counseling. I did not know the damage and the difficulty, the complexity of complexities of grief until I started getting into grief counseling. And three or four months ago, or uh, weeks ago, I sat in a grief, um, grief uh, webinar all day from eight to five. And I don't do that. I don't have that kind of patience, but I did because it was a subject that I really uh, am passionate about. So you have to shop around, learn, before you can say, this is my niche. This is what I'm called to do. So you go from general to particular, but you within yourself, if you really know your passion at the back of your mind, you know that this is the population that you're called to do. Now think about it, think about it. I am passionate about prisoners. I'm passionate about drug addicts. I'm passionate about those whose marriages are failing, passionate about widows. What does that tell you? I am passionate about people who are being oppressed, <laughs> people who are going through difficulty, no matter what hats they wear, whether they're in prison, they're homeless, they are, they are divorced, their marriage is going in trouble, they're widowed. That's the same population. So whatever hat they wear, uh, that's, I'm drawn to them. And the uh, same thing, there are people who my wife is drawn to. My wife is drawn into system, into getting people to move forward and achieve their goal. That's not my thing. I'll teach you, uh, but you decide whether you want to learn or not. But my wife would knock your head and open your head and stuff it and get you going. That's her passion. So you have to basically try things out before you can say this is what I am called to do. Now, what do you try out? I'm gonna give us a few options of what's going on. Um, this is one, this um, next week, uh, next two weeks, Monday the 5th, this population is a population that goes from young adults 
to first five years of marriage. This is the worst time for a lot of people in marriage. Those first five years, a lot of things, they have the highest rate of divorce per season, per block of five years. So the first five years, if someone had been married for 30 years, the first five years was the most precarious, the most dangerous. It still happens. So that's why we dwell on this, to prepare those who are in it to say, don't kill yourself, this happens, to prepare those who are going into it, to prepare those who just got out of it. Because even uh, within 10 years, you're still licking the wounds of the first five years. Think about it. If you were disappointed because you thought your husband was going to be a Mr. Hunk and you discover that he's Mr. Couch Potato, uh, then that disappointment and resentment is going to linger on until you adjust to it. So this is, a, even though it says five years, it ranges from young adults who are preparing for marriage, those who are courting, those who are engaged, those first five years, first five years after these five years. That's the range of population that these skills are going to be uh, catching. So if you want that ministers to these people, this is an opportunity for you to get the skills. Now you can get it from our website. You can get it from our Facebook. You can also contact me. That's one niche you can have. You can also have this niche and stay there. Now the next one will be managing depression and anxiety, mental health for families. Now for a lot of us, we know it, the loss of employment, the loss of lifestyle, the change in lifestyle, all these things that are going on are reflecting in our mental mindset and health being challenged. So we're having a lot of people who are dealing with depression and anxieties in families. If you have this, you can't teach them how to make love when, for people who are suffering from this because that's not their immediate need. Their immediate need is to deal with this. Now, as a therapist, one thing you learn is that even though you have scheduled a session on communication, when your clients come before you, the question you ask them is, how may I help you today? Why do you ask them that question? Because you don't wanna jump the gun. You may have prepared for a communication, whereas they dealt with domestic violence last night. So you see your communication preparation is null and void. We got to deal with the domestic violence before we can go back to your schedule. So we want to ask them, what may I do for you? How may I help you today? And they say nothing. We want to continue. Then we continue with your schedule. If they say, well, something happened last night. Uh, we got bad news. My mom died. So you see, you go from uh, communication to grief counseling and comforting. Can I deal with that before we move forward? Uh, so that's about depression, mental health. The Vice National teaches this. I'm sure a lot of us would key into that. I've talked about grief counseling. I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot here, other than to say that the, our guests on this are people who have been in the trenches. Uh, Barista Gossier Udemezwe. Uh, has been a champion of widows even before her own husband died. So she was championing the causes and welfare of widows to the point that I, I kept wondering, why is this woman concerned about widows? She's not one. But that's like saying, why was I concerned about prisoners? But she had that passion and she is saving more equipped now. So she's going to be sharing with us. And then you have Robin, who has been a widow for 15 years. She's going to share from the American perspective. Uh, Josia will share from the cultural African perspective. That's why they are there. Uh, one other skill, we're going to talk about single parents and step families. So if you are a single parent or you minister to them, and every pastor should take this, because we have a lot of singles and single parents in our midst, we don't know what to do with them. We don't know, we go near the, they don't know what to do with us. They don't want to be called wives, not husband snatchers. You don't want to go near them because you don't want to be looked at somehow. Uh, so 
this will teach you how to deal with them comfortably. But um, among this, this Sunday, this is free. There's no money attached to this one. So this is another free course. So I'm going to have two couples who have just made it out of the first five years. They will share their first five years of marriage. So we begin to see uh, the, the challenges of that season of marriage. I wanted us to hear from the horse's mouth because my wife and I, we are going to be talking about the skills and the solutions but when we hear it from people who fought, who just their own fight is just fresh. Our own was 30 years ago, so I can't tell you what, what we did. But they will, yes, is just fresh. So they will share with us all the fights, all the frustrations, all the disappointment, how they handled it. This Sunday at 2 p.m., 7 p.m., 8, 8, 7 p.m. UK time, 8 p.m. Nigeria, 9 p.m. South Africa rejoin us here. So all these are niches you can have for yourself. But how do you find them? By trying them, taking courses, free one, uh, paid one if you can afford, until you find what you are comfortable with, what your tools have given you. Now, finally, I want to talk about self-care and managing yourself. What is self-care? Uh, self-care is a practice of taking active role in protecting one's well-being and happiness, especially during periods of stress. Now, let me tell us this. They told us that it's difficult to change people. It's also a very, very stressful calling. You might just say you're sitting down, you're thinking, but well, people are dumping on you every day. You got to take care of yourself. Let me also share one thing with you that I heard before I started this practice, that spiritually, those who do this are under attack. So you have to protect yourself spiritually. You have to protect yourself. But I do know that the pioneer, the two pioneers of marriage counseling in Nigeria, they kind of died early. And I'm, I'm not going to mention names, but I can tell you they died in their 50s one from Ibado, one from the East. That tells you a whole lot. This is a terrain that is very, very treacherous. You got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of your marriage. Uh, it's awfully hard when you sit down in the couch and you have people fighting over a wife saying he's not giving me enough money. And um, you find out that she's getting $10,000 a month and she's still angry and you're not getting $10 a month. So it's easy to go home and say, what about me? <laughs> she's getting 10,000 and she's complaining. I'm not even getting 10. Or someone saying, my, my wife and I do it three times or 10 times a week, uh, but that's not enough. And you're not getting any in the bedroom. So, <laughs> so you're complaining. Uh, so that's, so anyway, what is stress? Stress and burnout, physical, emotional, mental strain, or tension. Now, burnout is directly related to job stress. I'm not going to say a whole lot more about that. You have secondary stress, trauma, symptoms, and all the things that go with it. Now, I'm rushing because of my time. I don't really want to go a whole lot into that, but I want to talk about the science that accompany that. How do you know when you're stressed? Short temper, you are irritated. Poor eating habits, everything you see you want to put in your mouth. Poor sleeping habits, you can't sleep. Poor concentration, you cannot concentrate. More time spent on work, you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. Remember, it is mentally, emotionally, spiritually fatigued. You're just tired. All these are signs to tell you that you need to take a break. Someone asked me yesterday when we were doing webinar, uh, she asked me, what do I do uh, to self-care? What I do for, to self-care is to prepare for every session, pray for every session. And uh, at the end of the session, you leave it out there and move on with your business. But what you do before each session is more important than what you do afterwards. 
And because if you prepare yourself mentally, you pray, you meditate, you eat well, you rest, you do your homework, you're not doing this, you, the sessions will be a breeze. But if you're not prepared like the dull acts, you're going to put in more energy. You're going to come out of it harassed. And as I say, if you're dealing with low self-worth, you don't know who you are, you don't like who you are, you got to deal with that first because you're going to be challenged in session. You're going to be challenged by people. If you have things that you don't like about yourself, low self-esteem, anger, um, you have those. You got to deal with it. If you don't, uh, you will have clients in session who would spot that out. And they might exploit that to make you more angry. So prayers is one thing, relaxing before time, um, and then giving, spacing yourself. Don't crowd things up. Make sure that you have one thing at a time. I have this, it's an hour presentation. But the whole of yesterday and today, I was preparing for this. Why? Because I don't want to come here and make it harder than it should be. So what you do, like Abraham Lincoln said, you got to prepare four hours for two hours of presentation. That's the rule of thumb for him. But actually, the people that, that, that scientifically they say you must double, if you're going to speak for 30 minutes, you might prepare for two, three, four hours, just depending on your comprehension. Now, what do you do afterwards? Breathing exercise, meditation, taking a walk, nature walk, and all those things. Uh, so that is it. And I think uh, we are right on time. Um, so that is it for us. Uh, if you have questions, you ask, uh, especially regarding uh, courses that are coming. But I want to invite you back here on Sunday. We're going to be talking to those in the trenches of the first five years of marriage. Uh, so that if you are a practitioner ministering to these people, you want to hear from them. And next week, if you sign up for our course, uh, you then hear the scientific way of helping these people. So this Sunday, they are just going to share their experiences, what they are going through, what they went through. Uh, next week, we'll tell you how to help them. Uh, and if you're wondering, how do I get the resources that we shared here? If you register for any of our courses, other than surviving uh, first five years of marriage. If you register for depression and anxiety, if you register for grief, if you register for single families and, and blending families, any of those, just raise your hand and tell us, we I will give you the tools that I've mentioned here. Not Together Forever tools, not those four, the he's and has. I'm not going to give that. That's, that's for sale. But the other tools that I mentioned, the tango, the questionnaire, you're going to have them and a little bit more. But this is to say thank you for registering for our courses. And um, as, again, uh, let me, and I will ask, answer those questions for those of us who uh uh, coming up with the questions. We have four courses that are coming up. Uh, we have grief and loss. We have, um, let me, someone just asked uh, to run through it again. Let me run through it. Uh, married, first five years of marriage. This is coming up on Monday, uh, October the 5th. Uh, the next one is depression. This is coming up on October 29th. This is $25, just 25000 if you're in Nigeria, uh, 950 if you're in South Africa, $60 if you're in the U.S. All of them, you get a certificate for participating. If you're doing grief, grief is coming up on the 12th. And grief is a long time. It's from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It won't even be enough. I'm suspecting we will go beyond that because there's a lot to cover. If you did agree before, I'll re-invite you to do this for a token. 
uh, because I, I told us I went and relearned a full day of grief counseling changed my curriculum. So we're going to add a whole lot more to the grief that we did before. Of course, the grief you did before you paid 10,000, you paid uh, 500. This is a lot more than that. Um, if you are a single person, if you are a single parent, if you are blending families, in other words, your husband has children or you have your own, or you're intending to remarry, this course is for you. You're dealing with systems. I was counseling someone who is in a polygamous family yesterday and, and, and I was really laughing because I could see all the dynamics of blending families playing out. Uh, and that was fun. So um, that, that, those are it. Again, this Friday, this Sunday is free, just like this one is free. Uh, let me answer questions before I go to the two. Uh, someone says, tell us some tips on how to guide uh, to start a marriage counseling school. Uh, you're telling me to tell you how to compete with us. <laughs> I didn't just tell, people didn't just tell me that. I paid a lot to get there. But uh, seriously, you can reach out to me. I, without my sharing, I will give you guidance. Doc, are we going to receive the slides of today? No, no lexicon. <laughs> this is a free course, uh, not giving slide. Uh, how many days minimum, maximum for canceling? It's not days. You don't cancel by cancel people by days. You cancel people by progress. <laughs> Are they feeling better? Some might stay on communication for six months. Uh, in the U.S., where they have insurance paying, there are people who have mental health issues all their life. They've been in counseling. They don't see their psychiatrist or therapist every week. They might see them once a month, but they've been seeing the same therapist for 30 years. So it's not a matter of how many times. It's when you get results. It's when your client says, I feel good. I'm okay now. I can handle it. And then we terminate. That's a formal termination. You say, okay, next week we're going to have a termination session, meaning we're going to end the client therapist relationship. We don't just stop and let it go that way. We don't know if we're counseling or not. We end it. If they need you, they call you back and then you do another intake because you don't know what has happened. And then you start a new session with them. That's how it works. So it's not how many times, it's the process, the, the result that you're getting that determines when you stop or when you take a break. Um, uh, so anyway, someone asked me, sir, I did the cause grief and lost in July. Can I have the manual, um, no, not, not this manual, you got that one. <laughs> are you currently running widow support groups? N no, we are supporting widows through our partners. We're not running one directly, but we have partners who are running one. But this course is for those who are running widows support group so that you know, you understand the emotional challenges that they are going through, the complexities of widowhood and widowhood or widowing, uh, that process, not just that. And when we talk about widow, grief, it's not just those who lost someone, it's those who lost something. Everyone who has gone through divorce is grieving. And it's not just them grieving, it's their children who've lost their dad or mom who've lost their lifestyle, who've lost their identity. When we lose something like job that we've been at for 20 years, we grieve. When we lose lifestyle, we used to drive a Ferrari, now we walk on foot, we grieve. <laughs> when we move from one location to another, that's grief process that goes through, it, through those. So remember those who have gone through divorce, they are grieving which makes the single parent and blended families uh, uh, session more complex because you have two adults who agree.
grieving, trying to make it. Then you have their children who are also grieving the loss of their parents, the loss of their lifestyle, the loss of their home. All these people are trying to forge in a new relationship, even though they are coming from different systems. So you have a lot of grieving in that setting, that space that you have to deal with. And at least if you're not dealing with it, you have to acknowledge and recognize that these people are grieving. So, uh, and you do need skills to do, do that. Um, I didn't know this until recently. So should they be paying everything they come? Uh, so, should, so should they be paying every time no and and miriam you're asking a very good question we know we give we give a discount if you want to do this we just reach out to us if you've done our course before especially the grieve one the grieve one that we've updated a whole lot um that's our kindness really you can pay for more because i did pay to those people to get to sit in that class for a whole day i paid five hundred dollars for, for that one day course so well that's what we paid so but uh, because we are ministry oriented we will recognize that you've taken this course about a month ago and then we will give a discount uh, for it a uh, high dog case management and crisis intervention is not clear to me case management is removing obstacles that hinder your client from being effective. It could be court. It could be grief. It could, it's not directly related to what you're doing, but it's affecting the counseling sessions. It could be their job, stress-related job. So we intervene, either uh, talk to their boss, give them ideas on how to manage their job. If it's a case, he can't come to you because he has um, a protective order not to get out of his house from 6 p.m. And you do know that he needs to deal with his substance abuse counseling. You want to talk to the court and talk to the judge and say, my client needs this counseling to be effective and to be obedient. Otherwise, he's not going to follow all that you're doing. The judge wants to, him to do well. So they might make accommodation and say, on Wednesdays, we give him a pass. He can leave his house and come for counseling. That's case management. You are advocating for your client, removing obstacles that hinder him from continuing with the counseling. If his job, a man is working too long a job at his work, 16 hours. When he walks there, he comes home, he beats up everybody in the house. So, and uh, you know that that's what's happening. You might want to talk to his boss and say, hey, this guy is having problems at home. Can we reduce his hours so that at least he can be effective? Because when he's healthy, he will give you more production. So that's case management. I hope I've explained that. And it could be anything. He doesn't have a car. They don't have a car. They don't know. They don't have money. It could be connecting them to speaking for them on behalf to their landlord to give them a break, removing obstacles that hinder counseling and the sessions that you're going through. Crisis intervention will be dealing with things that happened recently. I gave us example, um, grief may be one, they've been doing so well and then someone loses someone and they are grieving, they are crying constantly, they are moody, they are depressed, or it could be having mental health episodes and that, that's crisis management. You have a crisis in your hand so you leave the counseling that you're doing and deal with the crisis first before you can move on with the sessions. Uh, you have to. Uh, so I don't know. I have seen five. Okay. Uh, how do we go about to receive our teaching on all these courses? I'm going to receive our teachings. I'm not sure what you mean, receive your teachings. Uh, case management and crisis. If you can clarify what you mean, that would help. I, if you're talking about the slides that I used, um, I, I, it's really not part of this. Uh, I hope you took notes. If you're talking about uh, taking the courses, uh, you can contact us. 
it's clear, really cl great to hear about the grief sessions offering. Are you able to refer a safe widows group that you're working with? Um, yes, I can refer. And in these days of um, coronavirus, someone can actually join a widows group anywhere. Most of those meetings are done online. Or oh, even though I, for cultural reasons, I will advise people to uh, go to a widow's group in their cultural setting because they understand the cultural perspective. And gr widowhood and grief of loss of someone is a, a, a great percentage of the cultural um, uh, pressures that are, that, are, that are present on those who died and expectations. So you have to deal with that. The lady that would be speaking to us on grief would address the cultural um, pers uh, perspective to grief in Africa because she's worked with human rights. So she has a broader view of the cultural uh, uh, dimensions of grieving and widowhood in Africa. So she's gonna talk about that and also offer you some tools that you can't, you're not aware of. Um, for instance, I think I've shared this before, um, we, we've had someone from, from Pumalanga area uh, that, that lost her husband and she said she was expected to marry her husband's younger brother. <laughs> that was the culture. So she was expected to, not expected, they were forcing her to marry her husband's younger brother. And they were threatening her, if you don't marry him, we're gonna take the children away from you. We're gonna take the house away from you. We're gonna take away everything you have from you. If you don't marry the, you, your brother, your husband's younger brother. The problem was that the younger brother was the house boy in the house when the husband was alive. So the guy, the woman is saying, how do I marry this way that I've been ordering around, that I've been sending around? So that's the cultural perspective to grieving. Uh, that someone locally will understand. I won't understand it because that's not my culture. I've, I haven't had that before until then. So, but overall in terms of how do you deal with uh, resentment? How do you deal with emotions? How do you deal with your crying? How do you deal with anger, with denial, with the phases of grieving? How do you deal with them? You're going to learn that from any group. Any group will help you manage those. Uh, I have so many questions. Um, let me see what else I can address. Is it going to be online, Zoom, or WhatsApp? Um, yes, all the trainings will be online, Zoom, uh, WhatsApp, and then stream to Facebook as we are doing today. All our trainings. Monday would ask, ask me if one is not a counselor, what is the process of meeting the magistrate or the police uh, just like that? You have to find out your local uh, requirement. I don't know what the, what the requirements are where you live, but I can tell you as someone who practiced law, the judge is looking for solution they want solution to the case before them. So anybody that offers them solution, they would look into it. Uh, it's, unless the client say, no, we don't want to go to him. And more, moreover, if you are doing pastoral counseling, if you're doing spiritual counseling, the judge has no authority to challenge your credentials other than you saying, I am a pastor. Uh, I am a Christian. We share the same belief system. In most cases, there is separation of state and religion or faith. So you can actually do a lot of things under that umbrella. And the judge will not ask you a lot of questions. Someone says, how can you handle a communication case that one out of the couple feels that marriage is not by force, ready to quit at any time? Yeah, let me ask, let me tell you, um, even God, even God, he says, give me your heart. <laughs> God is saying, give me your heart. He has your heart, but he still saying, give it to me. He gives you room to give it. What am I saying? If people don't want to be helped, there's nothing you can do. Uh, if people don't want to marry, you can, you can give them reasons to stay married. 
I had one last week, or we had one last week, but I gave him 21 reasons why he should stay in this marriage. At the end of the day, he told me none of them made sense to him, including being a father to his two children. That he, one of them he was carrying throughout the session. He said they don't make sense to him. So, so what do you do? You say bye-bye. So Jesus Christ, and for those of us who are not Christians, um, I'm a Christian, Jesus Christ said he was called to the Jews. He knew he wasn't called to the Gentiles. He knew he couldn't win all of them. And so we can't win all. So you try your best, your very best. Some will escape. Talk to us about the parable of the sower. Said some of them will fall on the wayside. Some will fall by the, by the tongue. Some will fall. They will fall. But one that falls in the right place would give birth to a thousand results. And that one is the one that you're called to serve. So if three misses, don't worry about them. Um, focus on the one you can get and get that result. So essentially I'm saying if someone don't want it, there's not much you can do. Uh, I think that's it, uh, brethren. I will stop here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for answering us. Please join us back on Sunday. It's free. First five years of marriage. Um, no, no, no. There's one on Sunday that is free. One on Sunday, this Sunday, we're going to be interviewing two young couples who just came out of their first five years. That one is free. And that the title to that one is My or Our First Five Years of Marriage. Uh, so that is free. Uh, the uh, course and the skills is not free. Uh, I wish you could make it free. I wish you have sponsors. Uh, but obviously we pay for these things. So we have to pay ourselves somehow, pay our bills. So anyway, that's it. Good night. Thank you all uh, in the absence. I keep wanting to get up and I get questions. <laughs> I get questions, but I will stop here. I will answer your questions. If you have comments, if you're on Facebook, type your question there. If you're on WhatsApp, type your question. You can send it. I have three people raising their hands. Um, sorry, if you're raising your hand, I know how to use it. Thank you, God bless you, I appreciate it. Okay, these are people saying thank you. Um, I said, uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, guys, I'm gonna take a break now. We will see on Sunday. Rejoin us back and we will zero down on first five days of marriage. God bless you. And from me and my vice, Phil Marshall, who is not here today, I say good night.